Leadership excellence, it's a journey and a process. Coming up right now on The Leadership Voice. Welcome to The Leadership Voice. I'm your host, Jay Barbudo. Today's show is all about excellence in executive leadership. And we have two terrific executives joining us today, each of whom founded companies and have built them to grow, thrive, and have both had to overcome adversity along the way. The Leadership Voice welcomes Dean Stoker, CEO and co-founder of Altrex, and Charles Antis, CEO and founder of Antis Roofing and Waterproofing. We also have a special leadership lesson today being delivered by Dr. Lorenzo Busy. So we have a great show for you today, but let's start things off with today's quote of the day. Today's quote comes from former CEO of eBay and current chairman for PayPal, John Donahoe. He says, leadership is a journey, not a destination. It is a marathon, not a sprint. It is a process, not an outcome. Our first guest today on The Leadership Voice is Dean Stoker, CEO and co-founder of Altrex. Dean's leadership and motivational skills, along with his ability to create, communicate, and realize a vision, are a driving force behind Altrex's rapid growth and leadership position in the $20 billion self-serve analytics market. Dean has led Altrex through three investment rounds and $163 million of venture funding on its path to delivering a data blending and advanced analytics platform that allow enterprises to modern analytic capabilities by empowering business analytics with capabilities historically found only in IT departments and requiring advanced degrees. The company went public on the New York Stock Exchange on March 24, 2017. Prior to co-founding Altrix, Dean Stoker held leadership positions at Integration Technologies, Strategic Mapping, and Information Services divisions of Dun & Bradstreet. These experiences have added to the content integration capabilities along with the customer and spatial analytics aspects of Altrex's SaaS-based platform. Mr. Stoker recently was awarded the 2017 Excellence in Executive Leadership Award for Growth at the 6th Annual Leadership Awards. It is with great pleasure that we at the Leadership Voice welcome an innovative and thoughtful leader who believes that once you can articulate the impossible, you are well on your way to making it possible. Please welcome Dean Stoker. Dean? Hi, Jay. How are you? Thank you for coming on the show today. Our viewers are excited to learn from you and hear about your journey. Terrific. My pleasure. Well, our first question is always the first question. Please tell us a little bit about your journey at Alterex and how you were able to uh, grow that business. So actually, today is the 20th anniversary of, of Alterex. We started uh, back in 1997, May 16th. And it's been a, a long journey. We, we uh, went through all kinds of circuitous routes to get to success. And, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot in the early days leading up to starting the company. I learned that, that most importantly, uh, you can only have one core competency. And the companies that I worked for often tried to do three things, you know, data, software, and analytics. And when you d invest your money three different ways, you tend to be, become mediocre at all three. So we started the company with a, a specific focus on driving an analytics platform. And uh, 20 years later, in an IPO and $163 million in funding, we're there. That's terrific. So as you, as you look at the journey, it's certainly not over. But as you look at the journey up to this point, what have been the biggest challenges or obstacles that you've had to overcome to get Altrix to where it is? Well, there's, there's been lots of them, obviously, in, in a 20-year time frame. I think the ones that are consistent that, that probably plague leaders the most are hiring the right people, making sure that you're always uh, trying to hire talent that's smarter than you. Uh, I think there's a, a, a serious need for driving cultures in organizations that allow people to uh, think about innovating and, and being part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, those are always challenges, especially uh, over a 20-year uh, time frame. And of course, the challenges of when do, when do you raise money and when do you, you know, the for, for me, I, I never liked the idea of losing my own money, but it was um, 
you know, it was one of those difficult tasks to, to want to lose somebody else's money. So I was self-funded for, for 14 years. Oh, that's terrific. So could you share with our viewers your basic leadership philosophy? And what does it actually mean to you to be a great leader? Great question. I, I, I think leadership, is for me, it's about uh, inspiring other people to want to do great things. It's, I don't think leadership is a person. It's not a, a style necessarily. It's, it's kind of innate. And for me, I, I grew up working for my father, and, and it, was, it was building great teams and inspiring other people to want to build things with you. And so they always say leadership happens from the front. But at some point in time, leadership should happen from the back, where you're inspiring other people to take charge and to do the things that drive businesses forward. Yeah, you've talked a little bit about how um, you've had a lot of work with the culture at Altrex. Could you tell us the story about the Volkswagen bus and the, the most interesting and unique conference room that I have ever had a chance to sit in? So the, the bus turned into a, a conference room idea when we decided to lease uh, 40,000 square feet in, in Park Place in Irvine. And I needed to, as part of our culture development, um, knowing that we were going to go public, I needed to make sure that I could attract and retain uh, great workers for, for years to come. And I needed sort of a, a central theme on, on, on explaining the long journey of how we got here. And the only way that I could come up with was, was to take a 1967 Volkswagen bus and turn it into a, a conference room. And that's actually where we do a lot of our recruiting and our interviewing. And most of the people that we end up hiring in the company have their final interviews in the bus. And it, it, it's symbolic of what we've become as an organization. Yeah, and it's actually kind of great because there's an expression, get the right people on the bus. Oh, totally, <laughs> totally. You can see how that <laughs> kind of fits really well. So you've, you've had this a span, that your, your career has spanned many years. And as you look back at your career, what have you learned during your career that you wish you had maybe learned 30 years ago? Things that would have really been useful to know 30 years ago. Well, I, I think for, for me, I was very patient in the process. And I probably could have been... Uh, I could have accelerated the process a bit more. Uh, I didn't start this business uh, with my partners until I was 40 years of age. And that's kind of risky for lots of young entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting a business. Uh, you might want to think about starting it a bit earlier. So for me, I, I, I wished I would have had the, the knowledge to do it when I was 25 or 30. Uh, I'm not... Uh, regretting anything that I did do, but but I think that people need to take a, a, an action earlier on in their career because it becomes a little bit more risky later on. Okay, terrific. So um, we have got a lot of young, uh, early career folks that are likely going to be watching this show. So if you were talking to a young aspiring executive that said, Dean, I'll, Dean, I want to someday be a CEO of a company, what advice would you give this young aspiring executive that will help them in this journey? Well, the, the first thing I would want to make sure of is that they understand the, the implications of wanting to be a CEO. Uh, you, you have to, in the early part, especially if you're starting a business and you're a CEO, you have to wear lots of hats. You have to know uh, lots and lots about lots and lots. And over time, the hard part is you have to start uh, giving up things. You have to start empowering other people. And that means you know more and more about less and less, or less and less about more and more. Right. And, and that's a difficult transition uh, for a lot of folks. And um, you know, I, I think that, that entrepreneurship and leadership is an important uh, uh, factor in everyone's life, whether it's you know, leading in business, or leading in families, or leading in careers, or leading in relationships. And so people have to make sure that that's exactly what they want to do before they start down that journey. Oh, that's terrific. Could you tell us a little bit about some of what Altrex is doing um, to give back to the community and to the, to the, uh, to, I always say, to leave things better than we've found it? Yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking because it's important as part of our, our cultural uh, development within the organization. So many years ago, when I was at uh, the University of Colorado, actually, I heard Buckminster Fuller. And, mm -hmm. and Buckminster Fuller said, uh, we, we're not going to, we're building all the right technologies for all the wrong reasons. And we're not going to be able to take care of spaceship Earth very well, nor for much longer, if we don't see it as a common cause. 
It has to be all of us or none of us. And so we started Ultrix for Good to allow our employees to give, employees, customers, and partners, to give software and time to worthy causes, 501c3s, universities who, who are, are, are getting students to cognitive learning skills. Mm -hmm. And we're doing amazing things. We're eradicating malaria in Zambia. We're bringing dignity to the homeless in San Francisco. Uh, we're, we're doing good work with, with uh, our platform. And at the end of the day, I tell my employees, I don't want work to define you. And, and so we have to have a way to give back, to leave Spaceship Earth better than we left it. And I think that's a terrific way that we can um, sort of wrap up our segment. Um, I want to thank you so much, uh, Dean, for being on the show today. Our viewers um, have been uh, honored to be graced by your wisdom and your experience. And I want to just take the time to say thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate for it. Being on the show. Uh -huh. And now it's time for a featured segment of the Leadership Voice. It's today's Did You Know? Today's Did You Know? comes from mentalfloss.com. What do Abraham Lincoln, Henry Ford, Walt Disney, and Milton Hershey all have in common? They're all historically great leaders that each survived bankruptcy earlier in their careers. Sometimes great leaders fail, and this goes to show that being resilient and bouncing back from these failures is ultimately the path to success. It's now time for the Leadership Countdown, where we give you, our viewers, a useful list of key strategies or tips to guide your quest for excellence. It's been estimated that 50% of all executive careers will end in failure. We refer to these failures as leadership derailments. Simply, a derailment occurs when an executive or senior leader plateaus in their current role due to significant blind spots or weaknesses. So what are the most common derailers that leaders need to avoid? Chief Executive Magazine recently reported a top 10 list in their January 2016 issue. The top 10 greatest causes of leadership derailment, right here on the Leadership Countdown. Number 10 is an inability to deliver results. This can be seen as a lack of prioritization, time management, and or accountability. If a leader lacks any of these skills, there are hundreds of useful resources that can be accessed and implemented. These skills are completely teachable and well within reach of any leader to develop. Number nine is emotional intelligence. 90% of leadership success can be attributed to leaders' ability to manage the social and emotional aspects of the workplace, which equates to emotional intelligence. Number eight, biggest derailment, is a lack of trust. Trust is commonly regarded as a core competency of any leader. Quite simply, if people don't find a leader trustworthy, the leader's career will likely fail. Beyond a basic understanding of how trust works, Delivering against trust expectation for some is easy. For many, it's a challenge. Trust is a basic and essential soft skill. Number seven on the list of the most common leadership derailers is poor hiring decisions. If organizations are doing a poor job of hiring individuals with solid leadership skills, then the selection and hiring process needs to change. Number six is the inability to change. Leadership means constant change, and therefore, leaders must be change agents in their personal life and with the people they lead and interact with. Number five is a lack of interpersonal leadership qualities. Leadership is predominantly a soft skill. A few may be natural born leaders, but for the rest of us, however, we must learn the craft. This is what it takes to avoid this leadership derailer. And number four on our list of leadership derailers is if the leader lacks a clear vision. Developing and executing strategy is a process, a process that must be learned. There are seminars and various programs that are plentiful. Behaviors that conflict with organizational values, on the other hand, are a whole different story. Next on the list at number three of the most common derailers of leaders is ego and arrogance. When an individual's natural style is to self-serve before serving others, it frequently leads to success in their own specialty. However, when individuals with these same qualities attempt to lead others 
utilizing these same self-serving strengths, they frequently fail. The number two derailer for leaders is a lack of sufficient education and training. So many leaders are thrust into leadership roles without the requisite leadership skills needed to thrive. So it will be up to these leaders to prepare for these leadership opportunities as early in their careers as possible so that when your time comes, you will be ready. Additionally, leaders should be in a constant state of development, always looking to improve and become a better leader. And the number one cause of leadership failure in organizations is a lack of teamwork. The ability to develop others and work with others and lead teams is a competency that is essential in today's global marketplace. Adding to that challenge, effective teams are becoming increasingly diverse in their composition and can span around the globe. Intellectually, everyone understands this, and yet when teams fail, it's the team lead that commonly gets blamed. And that, viewers, has been your leadership countdown, as we have shared 10 of the greatest causes of leadership derailment. So learn these and avoid every single one of them. Stick around because we have Charles Antis in the studio and we'll be right back after this commercial break. Well, we found here at Honda Center in Anaheim Ducks that, that the Center for Leadership brings expertise in doing research, in doing training. The faculty that has come and, and, and given the training to our employees does all the research themselves. They're not pulling this information off the shelf. They're out there researching themselves, talking from first-hand experience, and it brings such a level of competency that we, again, don't find from, from other trainers that are on the market. Well, simply put, is, is what really differentiates and distinguishes Fullerton and the Center for Leadership um, really is your expertise. You guys um, are able to create customized content for our business based on true research. The faculty um, from Cal State Fullerton, obviously they're, they're professors of their field, they um, have deep knowledge and research, um, but also, aside from the theory, they really bring in some practical examples and they bring in a lot of interactive activities. The Bringing Learning to Work initiative is our way of meeting the needs of Orange County businesses and communities. When our clients ask the Center for Leadership to come to bring learning to work, the clients know that they're getting cutting edge information, the latest thinking in the field, but they're also getting world class training. Welcome back to the Leadership Voice. You know, every time I watch this commercial, I think that every business in Orange County should probably use some additional leadership development training. And those of you watching right now, I'll bet your company has leadership development needs that the Center for Leadership may be able to help you develop. Our second guest began his career in the roofing industry in 1984. Charles Antis, founder and CEO of Antis Roofing and Waterproofing, has become one of the most trusted names in the Southern California roofing industry, as well as a philanthropic leader in the community. Roofing expert, entrepreneur, and humanitarian, Charles Antis is a member of numerous roofing associates and business groups, including Vistage 390. He is a member of the board of directors for the Orange County chapter of Habitat for Humanity, and his company has donated every roof installation of every home built by Habitat Orange County since 2009. In 2014, Habitat Orange County awarded him Volunteer of the Year, and Action Property Management bestowed Antis Roofing and Waterproofing with the prestigious Community Service Award. In 2017, Antis was awarded the Community Involvement First Place Award at the International Roofing Expo sponsored by the National Roofing Contractors Association. And in 2017, Charles Antis was the winner of the Ex Excellence in Executive Leadership Award for Innovation. He also serves on the board of the Ronald McDonald House and on the external advisory board for 1OC, and recently has joined the board of directors at the Center for Leadership at Cal State Fullerton. It is with great pleasure that we at the Leadership Voice welcome a great leader and an incredibly philanthropic leader that has proven to the Orange County community that you really can lead from the heart, Mr. Charles Antis. Thank you. 
Charlie, thank you for coming on the show. I know I'm not supposed to call you Charlie, but I couldn't resist Bring that it. one moment. Charles, thanks for coming on the show. Our viewers are really excited to learn from you and hear about the incredible journey that you've taken. Excellent. Um, maybe we could start by, you could share with us the journey that you've taken here at Antis Roofing and how you've grown the company to the, the size that it has become. Wow, there's a, there are a lot of twists and turns in the journey. But I think early on, there were, there were a lot of self-discovery moments that we'll probably get more into in a minute. However, uh, I had no idea that we would end up in a place we are today. It's very much what's happening in the world that we are fortunate enough to be kind of on the pulse of, and that is we see purpose really showing up in business today, unlike it did earlier in my career. At least I couldn't recognize that. So that's the exciting change that we see shifting in the business marketplace. So you started out as in the roofing business. You had this young company. You're reaching out and starting to make this, make this business succeed. And you go out and you start going out on job calls. Tell us about that, that turning point in your, in your career. Well, early on, it was, I had to be good at what I did. I learned to be great at what I could do. I couldn't re-roof yet. We didn't have the crews, but I could solve leaks. So I became the very best at solving leaks, and that gave me a marketed skill. However, it was difficult to survive in the beginning. We, we needed every call to produce money just so I could pay my mortgage bill. And I only sometimes had a, a few calls a week. And under that environment of needing work, we had an early experience that I think you're referring to where we, we got a phone call from a mother who had leaks in every room. So I went to this job needing this money earned from solving these leaks to pay my mortgage. And as I pulled up to the house, I saw that it was not a real nice house. There was no lawn. It was set back on this field with a flat roof. I knocked on the door. And when the woman answered the door, I could see right away this was not a place that would likely have the money to pay me. And I just wanted to get out of there because I had an obligation to feed my family. But that exact moment, I was overwhelmed with this smell of mildew. And it hit me, like, what am I doing here? How can I make my ends meet at this home? And what broke the spell was this little five-year-old blonde girl who just looked up at me. And she grabbed my hand because she couldn't smell what I smelt. This was her home. And she wanted to show me her home. And she took me and she showed me her living room. She took me into this disheveled hallway. And finally, we walked inside her bedroom. That was her little castle. But all I saw was four mattresses on the floor with moldy bedding. Cognitive dissonance at that moment. What am I to do? I need to make money. But suddenly at that precise moment, I think, is where purpose entered. Although I didn't recognize it at that moment. And with that story, with, with that, that exact moment, I realized mortgage isn't for a couple more weeks. Maybe we can provide a roof. And so we donated a roof. I had to go out and find six volunteers because I didn't have employees yet. But we donated a roof and we kept that roof dry. And that started something that I later would recognize would be what built our culture and built our company. In many ways, this, it, it describes as, as a turning point for your company, doesn't it? It's a turning point early on when we just got started. It gave us momentum, but I couldn't understand what was happening until many years later. Over the years, what happened since that time is we would have another scenario where the family had a disease and they had a deck that was leaking and we had to do something. And it wasn't like I was excited, to be honest. I wasn't like, hey, what can we donate today? It didn't feel like there was enough money back then to take care of everybody. But that's the part that I wish I would have learned earlier, that there is enough, that when you play the long game and when you do the social good, you will do well in business. And that's where we sort of learned it, but it didn't become part of our philosophy. It wasn't written into our code until the last few years. And I think that's, I think that's a wonderful... Uh, lesson for a lot of businesses to learn and it sounds like your company learned this lesson very early on and uh, Antis Roofing and Waterproofing has grown in its community involvement and it's and is recognized and understood as the most philanthropic roofing company really <laughs> within uh, within certainly in Southern California but I think the, it, the, the, the border, the boundaries go beyond Southern California. And I think that 
uh, anybody that's been familiar with Antis Roofing and Waterproofing, they would be uh, cheering right now because they, they know about the great things that you folks are doing. We, well, that's a great point. Because we are involved in that process of, of looking at, the, at all causes in the community as worthy, um, we attract a lot of amazing stakeholders. Our fans, our clients, our partners, our people we buy material from, our employees, we're all on the same team, and we believe that we can make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your leadership philosophy, um, or what, what does great leadership mean to you? I'll, before I get to me, let me talk about the person that runs Antis Roofing, and that's Karen Inman, and you met her. And okay. she's just a delightful person. But had, she had only worked for me a few weeks, and I was amazed at how well she organized and how everybody just seemed to just burn with energy after they met with her. And one day in my particular style of speech, I like to think outside of the box. I said, Karen, do you realize you have a superpower? And without meaning a beat, she looked at me, and she, without missing a beat, she said, sure, yeah. And I, you know, well, what is it? I lift everyone I touch every day. Wow, that hit me, she, and because she does. She lifts everybody she touches every day. How long, how long have you had this? Well, since I was 30, 31, she said. I don't want to give away her age, but that's 23 years of her lifting people she touches every day, and that is a phenomenal talent. Let's suppose she's wrong and she's only lifting 70% of them. She's, she's massively changing the world. So Karen has her, her particular style of leadership that really holds people accountable but puts the people first. That is a great style. My style is different, but that's why we are a great team. My style believes that I have to build the bridge to every single employee. That if we don't build the bridge all the way to each employee, they're going to fall off right into the water and it's going to be our fault. That's my philosophy. So I believe in a, harm, a harmony at work and a harmony in the universe that we owe it to our people. As companies, we owe it to our community to make our workplace the best it can be, to make the local environment the best it can be. That's my style of leadership, is lifting people, creating passion in them for good, and keeping the campground cleaner than where we found it. No, I think that's terrific. So as you think about your career, and you've, you've, you've had a, a long-standing career in the, in the roofing business, in the roofing industry, what have you learned during your career, as you look back, that would have been really helpful for you to have known, say, 30 years ago? Well, I could go down a lot of tangents there, but right. one of the ones that, that I think we discussed when I walked in here today is, I would say, God, welcome failure. Failure is your friend, but you can fail fast. And so I think when I used to fail, I used to hide it. I, used to, I, I didn't want anyone to see it, my own team, my own family, my own, any of my stakeholders. And now when I fail, I like to poke at it. I like to call attention to it. I like to say, hey, what can we learn from this? And so there's a, there's a lesson in failure that we all can, we, we all can enjoy failure. And we all can, we not need, we, there's no need to be ashamed of failure. All of the greatest people that I know, that I look up to, the leaders in the world, whether we're talking about presidents or business leaders, they fail the most. So welcome failure is just one area that I would, I would tell young people to do. But looking back also, I wish that I realized the power in doing good earlier. Because it wasn't until three years ago that we actually put it into our brand and started talking about it. We talk about it so we can do more social good. The great when the great discovery is we also earn more and the company grows more than it ever has, which means we can do more good. So it's this repeating cycle that's mm -hmm. amazing. And when you talk about failing fast, and you talk about failing well, uh, we're not talking about that we want people to fail, but rather we want to create a learning climate where failure is an opportunity to develop wisdom, right? Yes, yes. Wisdom only comes through failing. Wisdom doesn't generally come through checking the boxes that you were taught to check. So through failing, there's that self-reflection. There's that, that you're right, it, it's, there's that moment where the whole group, not just me, we all look at it and we all learn from it. And when the team sees that the leaders can fail, then the team can fail, and it creates more honesty, more transparency. Your silos are, are shed and you have 
sales communicating with production and the field con connecting with marketing and you have your team humming on all cylinders. So you created your own business, say, how many years ago was it that you started this? 28 years 28 ago. 28 years ago, almost 30 28 years. 28 years ago and one week and four days. Okay, terrific. So if you were to talk to a young aspiring executive, maybe a young aspiring entrepreneur that wanted to start their own business and build a highly successful business, what advice would you give this young, aspiring, energetic, ambitious entrepreneur to, that might help them succeed? I could go in a lot of directions, but the, the, the thing that I think I've discovered the most that's changed my life the most, that's allowed me to live the life that I've always dreamed of, is inviting fulfillment, inviting purpose into work. Now, how do you do that? That's, that's a question I can't answer shortly, but you might start by asking what it is that fulfills you. You might, you might uh, consider joining a committee for a nonprofit. Um, or, or a cause, so maybe at your college. You know, corporate social responsibility is, is a word that's overused, but it's, it's under that umbrella. And corporate social responsibility if, is doing well by doing good. I'm gonna give you a deeper meaning that I think might, but although I'll, I'll, I'll debate this tomorrow because we're always trying to get the right words, but it is believing that we can create our own world and make it the best place that we could ever live. So it's, it's creating the world you want to live in. That's social responsibility. That's the most important thing that I could give any young entrepreneur or any young executive uh, to get on that path, join some committees, find what fulfills you and talk about it and then bring it to work. And you'll find that you'll communicate with people in a deeper level. People will trust you more because they understand a cause that you believe in. And you'll find that you'll, you'll actually not dread work. Work can be something that you can get excited to show up on. Monday mornings are not, you know, Sunday night blues don't have to be Sunday night blues. Oh, that's terrific. You know, I think, Charles, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing with us your leadership journey. You're really an incredible leader with a terrific, a true superpower for activating purpose in others. And a lot of us can learn a great deal from you, and the business community can certainly learn a great deal from you. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. My sharing pleasure. your time, experience, and wisdom with all of us. Thanks for asking. We really appreciate it. A lot of fun. It's now time for the Leadership Voices Leadership Example. Every year, the Center for Leadership at Cal State Fullerton recognizes outstanding executives for its excellence in executive leadership honors. Today's Leadership Example brings you all of the past winners of this prestigious Southern California recognition. that? You know what that means. It's time for today's leadership lesson. Are you ready to learn? Albert Einstein once said, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it well enough. Joining us today on the Leadership Voice is Dr. Lorenzo Busy, Assistant Professor at Cal State Fullerton, to talk to us about the journey that leaders follow on their path to success. Hi, I am Lorenzo Busy. And this is today's leadership lesson. We're going to talk about the epic journey to become a leader. Every entrepreneur or CEO will tell you a different story. However, strikingly, there are some similarities in all these stories. The journeys sound like heroic quests against all adversities. At the beginning, there's a dream that sparks enthusiasm. Then there are challenges, failure, and despair. But they don't give up and conquer all challenges to bravely emerge as leaders. So what can we learn from these stories? Three main lessons. First, at the beginning, the expectation is that things will be easier than what they actually are. This is because passion is a powerful motivator 
but he also biases reasoning and makes you underestimate the probability of occurrence of adverse events. Second, when things get rough, leaders don't give up. But why do others give up? Once Steve Jobs said that giving up is not a sign of weakness, but it is often a rational decision. Because unless you have a real passion, the expected outcomes of your success are inferior to the sacrifices you have to make. So unless you have genuine passion, it's just rational to give up. Third, after they have failed and failed, they suddenly start becoming successful. How come? This is because failure nurtures learning, gives perspective and focus. But this is also because persistence across failure makes your leadership skills visible to your employees, partners, investors and customers. You cannot gauge a captain's skills when the waters are calm, but only when there's a gale. So one, don't let passion bind your reasoning. Two, yeah, don't engage in any endeavor unless your passion compensates for the sacrifices. Three, leverage failure to gain focus and to give visibility to your leadership skills. Good luck with your leadership journey and enjoy every moment of it. I am Lorenzo Dizzi, and this has been today's Leadership Lesson. Thank you, Professor Busy, for sharing your insights into excellence in leadership. It's now time for the Leadership Voices Q&A. Do you need some leadership advice? Well, you've come to the right place. Every show, we take questions from you, our viewers, and we answer them right here on the show. Today we have four questions, and our two guests have agreed to stay on and help us answer these questions for you. So thank you to Charles Antis of Antis Roofing and Waterproofing and Dean Stoker of Alteryx for taking part in today's Q&A. Our pleasure. Our All pleasure. right, we're ready to go? Yep. yep. Okay, so our first question is for <clears throat> Dean Stoker, and it comes from Ian in Fullerton, California. Ian writes, I made a mistake and the result has cost the company a lot of money, and while I didn't lose my job, I feel like my reputation at the company has taken a big hit. How do I recover at work after such a major failure? Ooh, great, great question, Ian. Um, if, if the mistake were intentional, the actions would obviously be very different. I'm assuming that it was an unintentional mistake, and it might be as a result of bad processes or procedures or bad data. What we do at our company that I think really, really helps out is to have post-mortems on every project. And so we all get together, all the stakeholders in a given effort, and we go around the room and we identify what we did well, what we did wrong, how we can improve it. Because invariably, you're going to have to go through a similar kind of a process, and we want to have incremental improvements each and every time. So I would make sure that you don't bank your career on just this one mistake, own up to it, have a, have a, and if no one in your company has, has requested a, a postmortem, make, make that recommendation because you would like to get it out on, all, all out on the table. Terrific. Love what you said, Dean. I totally agree. I, I think this could be a turning point opportunity for you. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you a comparison. Roofing business. One of my best employees, his first summer he worked on the roof, he lost two ladders on the freeway. You've seen the ladders on the freeway? I mean, we're lucky nobody was killed. He lost two ladders on the freeway. He accidentally tore the passenger mirror off of two boss trucks on job sites, and he re-roofed the wrong house. One of my best employees ever. So my point is, is when it, as an employer, as a senior leader, we recognize those people that make mistakes sometimes are the ones that are trying the hardest. So if they don't hide it, if they hide their mistake, that's a red flag. As long as they talk about their mistake and do the postmortem, then we have a solid employee that's going to really move mountains for us. Okay, terrific. Let's go to the second question. Excellent. So our second question is for Charles Antis of Antis Roofing, and it comes from June in Beaumont, California. June asks, if you were to name one attribute that a successful leader must possess, what would you say is the most important? I, I think it, it goes along the, si the, the, uh, along the lines of compassion, self-reflection. 
I think that when we start our careers, we think we have to do everything right and we can't self-reflect. But I think the great leaders that I see, they understand their strengths and their weaknesses, they talk about it, and there's a humility in that that makes them authentically who they are and they can lift the people around them. Our third question is for Dean Stoker and it comes from Tam in Westminster, California. Tam asks, how do you lead a team when there are some people on the team that really don't care about the company, its goals, its core values, and really it seems they're just looking out for themselves? Interesting. I, I think that for the first thing I would do would, would be to uh, query our HR team to make sure that we're hiring the right kind of people who don't demonstrate those kinds of skills at any point in, in the uh, process. Um, but there's an old saying in business that, that uh, bad is stronger than good. And sometimes as leaders, you have to take people out uh, who, who create a culture that isn't very uh, uh, strong for the organization. And so uh, that's one thing I would definitely do is make sure that you attack the, the, the bad in people initially. Uh, but I also think that, that uh, again, the, the idea of, of compassion is that we, ha we have to have peer pressure on, on people to, to bring them, to, to lift them up, to make them better than, than they were yesterday. And uh, so I, I think that uh, you have to be really careful to know, you know whether someone's recoverable or not and uh, either rise them up or move them out. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well said. 100% agree. Okay. Terrific. So our fourth question is for Charles Antis. It comes from Chris in Lake Forest, California. I'm a junior in college and would like to someday become a CEO of a large corporation. What should I do while I'm in school to best prepare for this ambition? I think I go back to a question you asked me earlier for an entirely different question, but I think the best thing that some, a, a student could do is to get involved. Get involved with what your passion is. For example, if you get involved with a nonprofit, you're going to find the most, the highest level of community leaders are also servants. It's a really common theme. It's not, and hearing Dean talk about giving back to his employees doesn't surprise me because I think a lot of us have discovered that. So if you want to discover both what matters and what's going to help your career and, and what fulfills you, but also to meet the right people that can help mentor you, you're going to meet them on, the, they're going to serve on the boards of these nonprofits and they're going to have alignment with you with what fulfills you. And I think that's a very good path for mentorship. Plus, I think you get not just that give back culture, but, but nonprofits need lots of help, and so you actually can surround yourself with the skills that will help you in business. Things like finance and HR and marketing and, and fundraising and the things that are going to be beneficial when you do become that CEO. No, that's terrific. Um, I want to thank you guys both for being a part of the Q&A session today. Um, this is kind of a new, new way of doing our Q&A segment on the show. Um, and this, for our viewers, this has been the Leadership Voices q and I want to thank our two guests. We have Dean Stalker and Charles Antis, uh, who both really carried the day today. Now, if you have a question or you need advice, having leadership challenges at work and need some expertise and insights, send us your question right here to the Leadership Voice. You can email us at leadershipvoice at fullerton.edu or contact us by Twitter at CSUF underscore leadership. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today's show. Today we explored excellence in executive leadership and learned from two accomplished company founders. Thank you to Dean Stoker from Alterex and Charles Antis from Antis Roofing and Waterproofing. Thank you also to our special faculty guest, Professor Lorenzo Busy. Join us each episode of The Leadership Voice as we will have two more executive guests, another special leadership lesson, and lots, lots more worth tuning in to see. I'm Jay Barbuto, and on behalf of the Center for Leadership in Mahalo College of Business and Economics, we'll see you next time right here on The Leadership Voice. <music>